Good evening. We're here this evening at Damasuka Meditation Center with Bhante Bimala Ramsey, and he's going to be giving a talk from the Majima Nikaya number 113, the Saparisa Sutta, the true man. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathan Pindika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus. Monks, venerable sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this. Monks, I shall teach you the character of a true man and the character of an untrue man. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, the monks replied. The blessed one said this. Monks, what is the character of an untrue man? Here an untrue man has gone forth from an aristocratic family and considered thus. I have gone forth from an aristocratic, uh, aristocratic family, but those other monks have not gone forth from an aristocratic family. So he lauds himself and disparages others because of, of his aristocratic family. This is the character of an untrue man. But a true man considers thus. It is not because of one, uh, one's aristocratic family that states of greed, hate, or delusion are destroyed. Even though someone may or may not have gone forth from an aristocratic family. Yet, if he has entered upon the way that accords with Dhamma and entered upon the proper way and conducts himself according to the Dhamma, he should be honored for that. He should be praised for that. So putting the practice of the way first, he neither lauds himself nor disparages others. Because of his aristocratic family, this is the character of a true man. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to read this was because there's a, a lot of mention of true men in the suttas. And there's a lot of mention of uh, now it's, it's just skipped me. Well, there, there's mention of of men that are that are true um, practicers and are successful. So it's uh, I've had a few questions about what's the difference between a true man and, and uh, somebody that's successful with their meditation. And a true man is somebody that they consider themselves just a man. It doesn't matter where they come from. During the time of the Buddha, there was an awful lot of people that were very wealthy and came from very rich families and then became monks. Some of those, uh, some of those people would kind of demand that other people do things for them and, and that sort of thing. And that's not the way of the Sangha. It doesn't matter where you come from. Even if you're an untouchable, it doesn't matter. There is only human beings. 
So this is this is what being a true man really is. It's somebody that doesn't get caught up at all in uh, thinking you're better than anyone else because you're wealthy or you're uh, overeducated or whatever. So when I was in uh, Korea, I'd given a retreat. I came back the next year giving another retreat. And the people that had done the first retreat, some of them had been very successful with their meditation to a point. They, they weren't real successful, but they were reasonably, they'd gone through all of the jhanas. And they started strutting around, say, well, I've got this jhana. And uh, that can turn into a real problem because people will hear you say this and they don't know whether it's for real or not. And it's easy to get criticized and that sort of thing. It's one of one of the things that monks never talk about is what their practice is. We don't talk about our own practice. I have a lot of people asking me about my pra practice, but I don't I don't talk about it because it doesn't matter. What matters is the Buddha's teaching and your own practice. And this gets kind of funny in a way because if you do a retreat with somebody else, you pretty much know what their practice is. So you can talk with them about it, but you don't talk to people outside of that small group of people of what your attainment is, if there is any. And that's been translated into you never talk about your meditation practice to anyone. But there's advantage of talking to people that have close to what you you have for experience because then you can you can compare notes with each other and that can be real helpful sometimes so the the real trick is you you talk with somebody else about what your practice is and they, you compare your notes then when you leave them you don't talk about them and their practice at all but you need to be able to get together and uh, compare notes quite often there is one lady in Indonesia that she thought she was an arahat and she was telling everybody about it I've had this experience I'm an arahat and I talked to her by Skype and she she wasn't nor was she an anagami so <coughs> She was trying to build herself up and kind of look down on other people because they weren't as good as she was. And that, that runs into problems. Moreover, an untrue man who has gone forth from a great family, from a wealthy family, from an influential family, considers I've gone forth from one of these kinds of families. But those other monks have not gone forth from being influential or whatever. So he lauds himself and disparages others because of this influential family. 
that too is a character of an untrue man they have a tendency to talk about a lot of stuff that doesn't have to do with Dhamma and a true a true man he he is more interested in Dhamma and how things work but a true man considers not thus it is not because of one's influential family that states of uh, greed hate or delusion are destroyed what is greed hate and delusion greed is the I like it mind hate is the I don't like it mind and delusion is the belief that it is me so what are we talking about here? We're talking about people that are caught by their craving. So it's a real um, interesting thing that it's necessary to be able to recognize craving when it arises and craving can arise in quite incredibly quickly and you don't even notice it but it's easy to get caught up in emotional states of dissatisfaction dislike and you are taking those personally you, if if you weren't taking it personally, it means that you would have equanimity in your mind, so that there would be balance and there would be no emotional reaction. There would just be, with balance, a response. Craving is always recognized as tension and tightness in your mind and in your body. Now, one of the insights I've had since I saw you last is that it talks about, uh, especially in the Satipatthana Sutta, being mindful of your body. But what is it actually saying? your body and your mind are interconnected if you relax your body your mind is relaxed if you relax your mind your body is relaxed and that is talking about the tension and tightness in your head that's what mindfulness of body is all about so Anytime you read or uh, at the end of a retreat, it was always kind of comical when I was doing the Vipassana that the last thing the teacher said or one of the last things they said is be mindful of your body. And how are you supposed to do that? I mean, they, they give you good advice, but they don't tell you what that actually means being mindful of your body means seeing that tension and tightness in your head around your brain and how that contracts that means that there is craving in your mind at that time it always starts with a feeling arises the feeling is pleasant painful neither painful nor pleasant doesn't have anything to do with emotion it's just a, a pleasant feeling a painful feeling a neutral feeling right after that there is this tension and tightness that wraps around your brain and right after that 
is when you start getting into your thoughts and your opinions and ideas and concepts and story and then there is the habitual tendency which is where emotions are this is where you fly off the handle and get angry or sad or fearful or anxious or whatever the catch happens to be and that leads to the birth of action which leads to a lot of suffering so the whole point of this meditation is to be able to recognize when it first starts that tension and tightness I haven't put you on a uh, well, what do we call it bio no it's not biofeedback it's the screens anyway a bio circuit um, it's it's a screen that's about this big it's copper and you put one here and you put one at the base of the spine and then you hold on to the the handles that are that are attached to them and you got to cross your left leg over your right leg and then you just start relaxing and relaxing and relaxing and relaxing and it starts to balance your energy but also you can get so peaceful and calm that you see the start of a thought coming up and you see that tightness right then or you can see a feeling starting to arise in your body and you see that tightness right then so it's a, a that was one of the best meditation teachers I've ever run across the bio circuits and it's that was using that device was one of the one of the things that taught me about mind and body and how it actually worked and it made me sensitive to the slightest feelings when they started to arise and that's why later I started noticing that relaxing the tightness in your head was the key to tranquilizing your bodily formation So I'll, I'll dig out a pair for you and let you try. It, it is worth it. It, 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 it. You you can learn a lot from it. So <coughs> the more familiar you come, you become with that tension and tightness that arises in your head, in your mind the more familiar you become with it the faster it is to recognize the easier it is to let it be and relax and with that when you let go of that tension and tightness you are purifying your mind because there's no uh, there's nothing that will pull your attention away to anything there is just this quiet mind that's very alert there's no tightness in your mind which means there's no craving so your mind is pure and you bring that pure mind back to your object to meditation and the more you do that the less craving there is the faster your progress becomes but you will find out that craving 
although it's not particularly strong, it is very, very persistent and it keeps coming up in all different ways. This is the cause of suffering. So it's an uh, important aspect to be able to recognize that tension and tightness, every time there's a thought, there is tightness with it. Every time a feeling arises or a sensation arises, there is this little subtle tightness that happens. So you want to be able to become exceptionally observant of that part of your body. The, the brain is it has this membrane around it and it contracts. It really doesn't do it a lot. But all of that little contra contraction, when you relax, it lets go. And you feel um, a little bit more open in your mind. But the thing that's most important is noticing that your mind is clear and bright. And that's the mind that you bring back to your object of meditation. It can't be stated enough, the relaxed step, because that is the cause of suffering. And what is suffering? Well, if I get something that I don't want, that's suffering. If I don't get what I do want, that's suffering. Why is it suffering? Because I am there. Whenever there is that slightest tension and tightness in your mind, there is the false belief in a personal self. So, the whole point of the meditation is to be able to recognize that. Now, the one of the easiest ways to do that is to stay on your object of meditation. And then you notice when something starts to come up, your mind starts wobbling and before long it's wobbling bigger and then it starts to go away from your object of meditation. Well, if you can sharpen your mindfulness enough, and this is done by smiling, the more you smile, the sharper your mindfulness becomes. Why? Because when you smile, you have an uplifted mind. And then when a thought comes in, it starts to pull your mind down. And it's easy to recognize that way. So the more you smile, the sharper your mindfulness becomes. The sharper your mindfulness becomes, the faster you're able to catch these little tiny disturbances when they arise. So before long you'll be able to notice that your mind does wobble before you're actually able to see how it, 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 it get pulled away. And if you see that mind is starting to do this and wobble a little bit, then you six are right then. You relax. Smile. Come back to your object of meditation. The more you smile while you're practicing meditation, the faster your progress becomes. Uh, an awful lot of people, they really don't believe the fact that you're supposed to have fun when you're meditating. And it, it takes a lot to convince some people that you, you're trying too hard. Back off. 
Have fun with this. Don't get serious with doing. We just had a couple leave not long ago and both of them are so serious and they're bound and they determined to attain Nibbana. Well, then it's not going to happen for them. Not until they learn to lighten up. That's just the way it is. So, keep it light. Okay? Don't get serious. Don't get to try to push and make something happen. The nature of this kind of meditation is it happens all by itself when the conditions are right. So your job is to make the conditions right. What are the conditions? Smile. Stay with your object of meditation as fast as much as you can. And notice when there is a disturbance that starts to arise. Then do the six R's. Relax. Let it be. It doesn't matter whether it's a physical sensation or mental. It doesn't matter at all. What matters is what you do with that. And your meditation is such that it's not going to be the same all the time. It's going to change. So don't look forward to having a great meditation and, and coming back and making it great again. That doesn't work, right? <laughs> it's real important that you realize all of life is part of a game. It's nothing to get serious about. But we do get serious and we get upset because things don't happen the way we want them to happen with this person or that person and then, then it's real easy to get caught up in this whole cycle of pain. As you become more familiar with how mind's attention moves from one thing to another, you will start to develop more and more balance in your mind. Now this is all the time. Too many times people have the idea that uh, Meditation is just about sitting, but it's an all-the-time practice. Watch what your mind is doing when you're walking from here to there. Don't let it just ho-hum around. Wish happiness. as you wish happiness and you give that happiness away, guess what happens for you? More happiness comes. What you give away, you get. So it's a real interesting phenomena that when you start becoming more and more aware of how little tiny things start and then it turns into an annoyance of some sort. I want things to be the way I want them. I don't care. Well, good luck. Doesn't happen that way all that often. <laughs> so you need to have that balance of mind. That's really important the equanimity as you start to go deeper in your practice the equanimity equanimity starts to get stronger and stronger so it's an important thing to be able to recognize when mind 
starts to get tight. And when body starts to get tight. And the more fun you have with this meditation, the easier the meditation becomes. Too many people are way over serious about getting something, some kind of benefit. Well, you really do gain great benefit when you let go of trying to gain great, great benefit. As Yoda has said on occasion, there is no try. There's only do it or don't do it. Don't try to control anything. Don't control anything. Stand back and watch how it happens. Keep relaxing into things. Keep smiling into things. And the more you do that, the easier it becomes. Now, I've done a lot of retreats with a lot of people that were practicing straight vipassana and they very seldom do they have faces that look happy they just are trying so hard they're pushing they're trying to make something occur the way it's supposed to and they hear that in their Dhamma talks that you're supposed to make this happen. And when you have a, a distraction or a hindrance arise, you're supposed to make it go away. Well, no. Hindrances are necessary for your practice. <coughs> uh, during on, on the night of the Buddha's awakening, he was one of the most advanced meditators in the world. And he still sat down to start practicing and he got hit with hindrances. And they were big and they were real and all he could do was watch them and let it be and never mind. It's not so important. When a hindrance arises, it is your teacher. It's showing you where your attachment is, but it's also helping you to improve your mindfulness so your mindfulness gets sharper. When you get to a certain level in your meditation, you start seeing that it's just a hindrance and it's not my hindrance then you start appreciating the fact that these hindrances are there. They're not making your meditation worse. They're trying to help you to improve your mindfulness. But if you get caught in your thinking and liking and disliking, you can look forward to that hindrance coming up and visiting fairly often. Until you learn until you learn that uh, it's only this hindrance. It's no big deal. It can be a memory. It can be a desire that you want something to happen in a particular way. It can be anything. It doesn't really matter. It's strong enough to pull your attention away from your object of meditation. So now you have to deal with it. You have to allow it to be by not keeping your attention on it, it won't get bigger. But when you keep your attention on a hindrance, it does get bigger and more intense. Because I don't like that, I don't want it to be there. 
I hate this feeling when it arises. Never mind. Just allow it to be. Don't resist or push. Soften your mind and smile. That works. And it works very well. But that doesn't mean that that hindrance still isn't going to be there. Just because you soften your mind and smile, you relax into it, it can still stay there. But as you lose your attachment to that hindrance, it can be there, but it's not going to pull your attention away. And when it doesn't pull your attention away, you just stay with your object of meditation, even if it's over here fluttering around and flip-flopping and all of this kind of thing. There's a deer. Ain't that nice? <laughs> so, as you stay on your object of meditation, that hindrance will start to get weaker and weaker and it'll fade away by itself. When it fades away, you go deeper into your practice. That's how your hindrance is helping you. That's how it's truly your best friend. It shows you where your, your uh, attachment is and you start allowing it to be there. So it's teaching you a couple of good lessons. One is that everything that arises is impersonal. It's not yours. You didn't ask this disturbance to come up. It's there because the conditions are right for it to be there. But what are you doing with it in the present moment? Are you fighting it with it? Are you at war with it? Or are you allowing it to be and not keeping your attention on it? So it's teaching you to develop your mindfulness more deeply. And it's a big help. And the Buddha actually, he had a couple hours of hindrances coming up. Now, the thing with this particular kind of meditation to realize is that relaxed step is the most important part of the meditation. Why? Because you're letting go of the craving. Craving is one of the reasons why that hindrance came up. Because there was the personal belief that these thoughts, these feelings, these memories, whatever they happen to be, are yours. And as you see that as it actually is and allow it to be and relax and smile and come back to your object to meditation, without getting caught up in any of the thinking about it, you are improving your mindfulness a lot. And it's changing your perspective. It's changing your view from I am that to it's only that. If it's only that, it's just impersonal. It's not mine. I didn't ask it to come up. I can't make it go away, but I can not keep my attention on it. Let it be. It'll fade away by itself. The more you get caught up in trying to solve a problem with your thinking, the more you're causing yourself suffering. And that's the truth. 
So we want to be able to let things be. Nothing is so important that you have to think about it right now. Nothing is so important that you have to try to solve the problem. There is no problem unless you make one for yourself by trying to solve with your thinking. Thinking is part of restlessness. And who's trying to solve the problem? Hmm? I am. And this problem has no answer to it. I mean, you can sit down and you can start planning that you have a problem with a, a person at work or wherever. And you can start planning and thinking, well, I'm going to say this to them and they're going to say that back to me and then I'm going to say this to them. That's all nonsense thoughts. That's all a game that your mind wants to play. So it's real important to let go of these kind of distractions. You can't solve any problem by thinking about it. So let it go. Right? Until you get into a situation with that other person, let it go. You don't have to worry. You don't have to have anxiety. You don't have to have dislike. You don't need any of that sort of thing. Why? Because that's where I am. And I'm building this little tiny thing into a big mountain that can't be solved. But when you change your perspective and see that it's just this little bump, it solves itself. So the more you can remember to let go of the distracting thoughts, seeing that tension and tightness in your head, Relaxing into that. Not allowing your mind just to ho-hum around. You need to smile. Come back to an object of meditation. Even if your object of meditation is smiling. So the more you can do that, the less suffering there is. Now this whole thing with the the being a true man is what I'm talking about. Being a true man. Not, not building yourself up and pushing others down. It is the fact that you're practicing Dhamma. That's when you become a true human being. When you are practicing Dhamma when you are spending time watching what mind is doing instead of letting it run all over the place, six are it. I don't care what you're doing. Six are. Let go of that tension and tightness. Let your mind become pure. And bring that pure mind back to your object of meditation. So it's a, a real interesting thing to realize that there's not one part of your life that isn't meditation. You want personality development? You want to let go of the things that cause mental upset? then it takes practice. The more you practice, the better you are at letting things go. 
the more giving, the more kind you will become. It's interesting too that we are our own worst enemies. We are hard on ourselves because we have this mental image, I'm supposed to be perfect. And you're not. And it's okay. It has to be okay because that's the truth. You got to make mistakes. Welcome to the human race. Show me somebody that didn't make a mistake. But the trick is not letting your mind become hard and tight with that self-criticism. Because that's just as unwholesome as anything else. You want to develop a mind that is kind to yourself. The Buddha said it very nicely. He said, anybody that truly loved themselves would never harm another being. Well, what does that mean? It means that you have to let go of the harsh criticisms of yourself. You have to start being kind to yourself. And the more kind you are to yourself, you start noticing other people. And you give that kindness away. And the more you give that kindness and love away, the more it comes back for you. That's what personality development is all about. It's not about trying and forcing and making things happen the way you're, you think they should. It's backing off and watching yourself and accepting yourself without criticism. And if you make a mistake, be aware enough that, nope, that didn't work. Let's try something else next time. So the more you can really be aware of what mind is doing in the present moment, the more you can be aware of that slight tension and tightness that arises in your mind and in your body and relax into it, the more successful you are in your life. The more fun you have in your life. So, what is Buddhist meditation? Personality development? Being able to recognize when that craving is in your mind and in your body and be able to let it be. To be able to let it go. the more you do that, the more balance you have in your life. The more fun everything becomes. And that's exceptionally important. Okay? So, do you have any questions? Well, if, if you see the start of the wobble, it's not come back, it's just stay with. <laughs> okay, it works kind of like this. You're on your object of meditation right there. And your mind is with it. And for whatever reason, the mindfulness starts to get weak. And mind starts doing this and then it does it more and it gets bigger and bigger and then finally it, it just goes away. 
So, if you can smile enough and have fun with this, you'll be able, before long, you'll be able to see when mind is starting to do that. And then you, re you use your six hours right then, and your mind just stays on your object of meditation. Sometimes people describe it like you're boiling water and a little tiny bubble is down at the bottom and it lets go and it starts to come up and then it gets up to the top and it pops. Okay, that's when you're al already lost, lost your uh, object of meditation. But to be able to see it as it's coming up and relax means that you'll be able to stay with your object of meditation more easily. Make sure that you do this with your walking. The longer you sit, the more you have to walk. Okay? So if you're starting to sit for an hour and a half or two hours, I want you to walk for 45 minutes and walk fast enough that you're breathing through your mouth. This is an important part of the meditation because you stay with your object of meditation while you're walking like that. And it picks up your energy. It gives you better blood flow in your body. And that helps your sitting to be good. Okay? Anything else? So how long are you sitting now? Um, I'm, since I've been here, I've been sitting for two hours. Okay, make sure you get some good exercise in. How long are you sitting? Okay, walk for at least 30 minutes. And when you're walking, it's best not to look around. It's best to have your eyes down a little bit so you can stay with your object of meditation. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yes? That's pretty good. Buddhist meditation is uh, most now in development. Yes, absolutely. It certainly brings my balance to the practice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you would uh, cop a lot of criticism from the purists. Oh, yeah. <laughs> who, uh, well, that's not my understanding. Uh, we'd have a bit of trouble understanding that. And it would uh, be a further departure away from true knowledge and knowledge. <coughs> <laughs> Good. I've said this many times. By far. <coughs> and I'm, I'd like to get a hold of the man that said this is supposed to be serious, and you got to, you got to really go for it. Some people feel like playing in danger. Trying not to miss anything. Yeah, yeah. Or, or the, the guy who kicks the chair. Somebody kicked one. He's watching this movie. He comes. Kick my chair. 
He was kicking the shit. You know, I'm playing. Okay. Uh, I just got up and moved the chair. But I could sit there going, oh, I'm going to you know, or I'm going to do something. You know. so, Solve the problem. Solve the problem. <laughs> trying to sit in the movie theater, peaceful, no problem. It's all black, there's everything's gone. And I'm just going to try to watch the Now, the biggest problem is that when you're watching the movie is trying to think the movie. Because uh. you miss an awful lot of stuff when you do that. But when you're having fun and being attentive, you don't right. miss stuff. Yeah, this whole process is about having fun. You yeah. go there, you're sitting there, you're in the mode of, I'm ha going to have fun now. But even even then, you have to six R sometimes. What movie? <laughs> I, I, I saw these things just flish, flickering, yeah, flashing. Right, they were kind of annoying, so I let it all go. <laughs> all those people got up. I, oh, got up too. It was good. It was good. <laughs> okay. Let's share some merit then. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.